Our next speaker is uh, has recently become the new executive director of Veterans for Peace, and uh, we welcome here him. Welcome him here from uh, Toledo, Ohio, and his name is Mike Ferner. He'll probably tell you about how he came about to be the, the new executive director. He was the former president of VMP uh, years ago, and he also spoke at Pink Stock, which is our previous name for Peace Stock. And he's, well, that was about 2009, but a long time ago. But uh, we're glad to have him back to the Red Wing area. And, so please welcome Mike Burner. Thank you, Bill, and uh, thank all of you uh, at this point for your uh, forbearance and uh, strong kidneys for holding out. Uh, I'm, uh, I just correct Bill for a second. Uh, I'm the interim director of Veterans for Peace, so it may not be me a whole lot, but when Veterans for Peace changes directors again, you'll know that the guy that you saw here was Anyway, we can get into some of that if anybody, uh, VFP members or others, are interested in the state, current state of affairs for veterans for peace. See me right after. I'll be glad to talk to you about what's going on. Uh, but I just want to say this what we have. One of the best reports that I've ever seen in veterans for peace and they're working hard and really throwing themselves into uh, writing the, the ship, so to speak, which uh, has been foundering on the uh, uh, on empty as far as the checkbook and the savings account went, so we're making some changes. Anyway, I grew up with a head full of John Wayne movies, and uh, in high school, uh, I graduated in 1969, and uh, that head full of John Wayne movies took me right into the military. And uh, I wanted to be a hospital corpsman, which wasn't hard to do since they were getting shot up pretty quickly in Vietnam. Anybody who didn't want to be a hospital corpsman, they, sometimes they stuck you in there. And I worked at the Navy Hospital in Great Lakes, Illinois for almost two years. And uh, one, of, one of my jobs, as everybody's job was there, was to try to put the pieces back together. I worked in a psychiatric ward for a while, and I worked on a neurosurgery ward where guys had taken uh, shrapnel and bullets in their spine and were never going to walk again. And a uh, whole number of uh, bits and pieces of humanity that come back from a war. And this really uh, dispelled the John Wayne movies and got me thinking seriously. And uh, I started learning about what was really going on in the world. Eventually I got out as a conscientious objector after about three years. I was in the slow learning class. <laughs> and, uh, but that uh, experience in the military turned my life into one of political activism and radicalism because I came out of that experience understanding the fact that my government actually does lie to people. And that helps you figure out a lot of things that are going on after that because you don't accept the uh, surface treatment as the truth and you start digging a little bit you can actually most of the time find out what's going on but don't ever think is the first draft of what the government's telling you and nobody I don't think anybody in this crowd is uh, going to be falling for that anytime soon but it was an important weapon and it uh, stayed with me my whole life. I got involved in the environmental movement in the late 80s. And uh, was a, practically a full time activist. Uh, and, uh, I, I ran into a guy in the late 70s who had also been an environmental activist for a long time. And we were both involved in the movement against nuclear power plants and other things in the environmental movement. And he came to the conclusion that what he was doing and you know, what many people in the movement were doing wasn't really working. 
because things were continuing to develop in such a way that it was pretty clear we were not going to start taking care of the environment. And you could take that subject line and say, uh, help people that are working for a better health system or a better education system or just plug it in anywhere. So he started thinking, what are we missing here? And he started researching the history of the corporation, going way back to East India Company and the other royal chartered companies, and learned that they had the power of nations, that they had the power to govern. And when the colonial, in the colonial period, both here and in other places, India and all over the place, the colonial uh, empires were building, these corporations had the responsibility to make money for the shareholders, which oftentimes in England's case were members of parliament. But they had the responsibility to make money for the shareholders, but they had the ability to raise taxes, to raise an army, and they governed. They governed. They were the government. So after our revolution, no more king, no more royally chartered corporations. And uh, people put the ability to charter corporations in the state legislature. And they thought that would, that would be a, a way to have some popular democratic control over what they do, corporations could do. And that worked for a while. Uh, you got to keep in mind that uh, we the people at that time was, uh, what, 10% of the population, you know, women, men without property, slaves, uh, indigenous Americans, uh, none of whom were considered persons. So the democracy at that time was anything but. But these uh, state legislatures tried to keep a short brain on corporations. And for example, if you got chartered by a legislature to build a canal, you better build that canal and not start investing money in land speculation or any one of a number of things, or your charter would get ganged and your business would be dissolved like in a bankruptcy. So this kept corporations a lot smaller, a lot less politically powerful than they are now, and corporations were always fighting back. Long about the end of the 1800s, uh, 1886, you might be aware sometimes this is actually getting into the popular uh, lexicon, the Santa Clara decision, uh, the Supreme Court ruled in the favor of a railroad. Interestingly, a majority of the Supreme Court were either on the board of directors of railroads or were railroad attorneys. So the railroads were trying to get things their way, and they brought a case before the Supreme Court in which they said they weren't being treated uh, equally. Equal protection under the 14th Amendment, which was passed to protect freed slaves. Corporations used that in the court system more than free slave ever did. So they're up before the Supreme Court and they're saying Santa Clara County out in California wants to tax us differently than uh, so and so over here and that violates our right to equal protection. The Supreme Court agreed with the first time corporations got a constitutional right that was supposed to be for human beings. Now this idea of corporations having the rights of people is not new right now. But when I first ran into this school of thought, uh, nobody else was dealing with this. Uh, I was lucky enough to get invited to join a group that Richard Grossman, a friend of mine, had started to research this whole business about corporations and how they came to rule. And eventually, as we learned more, we began to understand that what we were doing guard action. We were always defensive. We were always fighting a single harm after another. And we started to uh, analyze what was going on, and it was not hard to come to the conclusion that we were never going to be able to get ahead of the curve. We were never, to put it in the terms of uh, firefighting, we were not doing fire prevention. We were doing firefighting. And the corporations were able to light a hell of a lot more fires than we were ever going to be able to put out. 
So we were thinking, what, what do we need to do to change the way we approach our activism? And uh, you probably remember the Occupy movement around 2010, 2011. And the beautiful thing about that was uh, they understood this concept. And I just loved it when reporters would come up to a young person sitting down in a square someplace and they'd say something like, well, you know, if you got an a issue, you know, pick an issue or two that you were talking about, you'd get further. But you are just talking about uh, this democracy business. And, and the, even the young activists that I saw on TV were great. They'd look at the reporter and say, no, you don't understand. This isn't about health care or the environment or labor. And this is about the fact that we don't have democracy. And that's what's caused all these other problems that we're never going to be able to adequately deal with because we aren't running the show. And I don't know how many reporters got it, but that helped percolate through society. And what we need to do is change the culture so that courts can once again yank the charters of corporations that are working against the public interest. They didn't do that way back because they woke up one day and felt uh, inspired. That's how people thought about corporations, was that they were subjects and tools of the public to do a job and not to run society. But right now, we are in the peace movement. We're fighting one weapon system after another, one invasion after another. And you can, again, take that example and put it in just about any movement. So how are we ever going to get ahead of the game if we're always fighting against the latest harm that corporations come up with. Well, one of the things we can do is to understand that history a little bit, and a lot more people are understanding it now, but we can also look at the way we uh, talk about the issues we're involved in. What's our messaging in the term code? And uh, I'll give you one example. I work with a group in Toledo that's trying to keep Lake Erie from being uh, ruined by the factory farms in our watershed. And we put these big billboards up, and we talk about the, the lake, uh, how bad that is, and what, what factory farms do to the animals. And to try to work the democracy angle out a little bit, we've got one of those billboards that says, who voted for this? So here's a, here's a picture of hogs in a terrible situation in a factory farm, and the lake's ruined over here. And, it's, and we're saying more than just, what do we need to do to make conditions better for the animals or fix up the lake a little bit? We're saying, who the hell did this? Did, did any of us get to vote for this? Would any of us have voted for it if we'd understood what was going on? And corporations didn't have the First Amendment to be able to advertise ad nauseum and show movies to our kids in school and on and on and on. So that's why I'm hoping in Veterans for Peace we can start taking the lessons that have been learned about our strategy and our long-term thinking when we're activists and see if we can touch on those fundamental basic issues a little bit more and a little bit more clearly so that a generation from now they're not just fighting yet another invasion or the latest round of weapon systems but they're actually working to begin to control, to run the show, to have a government that is, does what it's supposed to do, that we don't have to fight against it all the time. In Toledo, uh, one of my heroes is a former independent mayor, and uh, the current mayor, who's going to greet the golden rule when it comes to Toledo next month, is familiar with this little bit of local history. And this former mayor's name was believe it or not, Golden Rule Jones. <laughs> and he was an industrialist who ran his factory by the Golden Rule. He got elected mayor and ran the city by the Golden Rule. Some people said he was crazy, but that's what he did and who he was. And the, my favorite quote of his is that government is the vehicle by which we express our love for each other. And that sounds great. We know how far from that we've come. And we've come that far from it because we don't run the government. It's being run for us by the elites of corporations who make sure the few profit 
had the large majority pay. So that's one of the things I'm hoping to talk about a little bit within Veterans for Peace, get us thinking a little bit differently while we continue to do the work that we always do. And uh, we'll see what happens. Uh, maybe we'll be able to help start the or move forward this uh, revolutionary way of looking at things a little bit. We'll see. Thank you. Yeah, Mike says he has a little more time yet. Uh, if you have any questions for Mike, please come forward. And any questions about VFP or, or something of that nature? Yeah, Dwayne. Uh, my name is Dwayne Olson, I'm with Doc, and uh, how can we, go ahead, go ahead. how can we as veterans of peace, or how can we as um, constituents of our ruling class um, make difference in, in uh, put our corporations in check so that they aren't uh, rolling over us and, and uh, keeping us all as a uh, how, how can we start to do this to put the corporations in check and turn things around with more of which the way that humanity would like or for the planet would like? Uh, it, it's not a simple thing. There, there could be any num number of ways that we can do that. One thing I mentioned is to just be aware of the fact that we have to be able to walk and chew gum at the same time. You know, we have to do fire prevention and firefighting. So while we're fighting the latest weapon system, we're talking about cluster bombs going to Ukraine or whatever it is, we try to include as frequently as, as it makes sense the fact that if citizens were actually running this government and it wasn't arms manufacturers who were setting foreign policy, that we wouldn't be doing that. I believe if the people in the United States really had the ability to look at these issues without 10 uh, tons of corporate propaganda, that we wouldn't have a government that makes these kinds of decisions. Now, call me a foolish optimist, I don't know, but if you don't believe in the people's ability to act humanely and run a government humanely, then I don't know where we go from there. So there's. People are going to come up with different ways to do it. You know, some people in the environmental movement are saying, we're going to pass a law that says we don't want fracking in our county, period. We don't care if it's within the EPA's guidelines of how many parts per million of whatever. We don't want that in our county. Well, constitutionally, that doesn't fly. But the thing is, is constitutionally, people were once property. And constitutionally, Women were not persons. So how did that change? Well, it changed because the culture demanded that we do better. And we don't have to follow the practices and the legal uh, precedents that have been set by people who profit when the interpretation of a certain way. So that's a, a, a bit of rearranging our thinking. It's not just boning up on, you know, what the blast area of a, a nuclear bomb is, or you know, whatever other statistics we always learn, but it's a, it has to do with thinking about ourselves differently and how that gets expressed. And who knows? There's a couple of ways I can think of it. There'll be lots of others, no doubt. Yeah. So that leads me to thinking, because you know what changed? Change ended slavery. Gave them the right to vote. Constitutional amendment. Well, be looking for a little something in your Christmas bonus this year, young man. <laughs> uh, the question was, uh, would I support the move, uh, the, the movement, uh, the group is called Move to Amend. in the House on the amendment that would take corporate protections away, that would take constitutional protections away from corporations. And I'm so glad you brought that up because that's, as far as I'm concerned, that's the 
one organized approach to this. Doc was asking how, how are we going to do this. Well, that, that was maybe the softball you were pitching me and I, you know, I had a strike one, I'm not sure. But anyway, yeah, move to amend. And uh, the uh, old friend of mine from this big group that I mentioned way back that we got involved with this, he used to work for the American Friends Service Committee and he was involved in trying to get cities to protest government spending way back in the late 80s and early 90s, so peace dividend we were supposed to have. And he and I, his name's Greg Coleridge, he and I are going to do one of the sessions at the BFP convention on this very topic. We'll have a little bit more time to explain some of these things. But move to amend. That's a, it's a good bunch. And they're for taking constitutional rights away from corporations, period. There's some people are saying we just overturned Citizens United. That would do it. That's only that's only a part. So thank you very much. We thank Mike so much for coming all the way from Toledo, and and I hope he enjoyed his stay here. He was up in Minneapolis yesterday for the regional meeting of Veterans for Peace, and and uh, now today here in Red Wing. So we wish him well and a good trip home. Thank you, Mike.